Hey, we are continuing in our series, We Are New Hope, and uh, we've been going through different attributes, different characteristics of what New Hope has been, the church, different traits that we have been, that we want to continue to be, and what we want to become. And one of the things that uh, we have been and we are is multi-generational. We are multi-generational. If you look around right now, you'd see you some gray hairs. You see some people that are younger. You see all, a mix and a variety of different ages of people. And, uh, and I am so thankful that we're a part of a multi-generational church. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2 and Romans chapter 12. 2 Kings 2, Romans chapter 12. It's our goal to remain multi-generational. And as I was preparing for um, this sermon, it was kind of difficult to find that perfect text that sums up why we should be multi-generational. I think if we look at scriptures, we see the theme of being multi-generational through uh, a, a lot of different texts. You know, in Deuteronomy, it instructs us to, uh, for people to instruct, it instructs us to instruct, um, uh, to teach our children and our children's children. And so you see multi-generationalism there. You see Jesus saying, let the children come to me. If you really study Israel and how the words has been passed down from generation to generation, you'd know that um, ancient Israel lived communally. They, they lived intergenerationally. And you'd have um, grandparents living with their grandkids. There wasn't retirement communities. There weren't nursing homes. There weren't these different things. And the way that the Old Testament was passed down was through living in proximity with one another and, and through oral traditions of, of telling the stories and, and sharing and stuff. And so we see the idea of being multi-generational uh, woven throughout Scripture. But there wasn't just a specific text that says being a multi-generational church is biblical, but I think I came close with this one. Second Kings chapter two, and you can follow along on the screens, verse 23. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel, and as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. <laughs> Young people, Respect your elders, because if you don't, they might just call down a curse from heaven, and there might be some bears headed your way, right? You know, I, I totally uh, say this text in, in uh, has anybody not, not read that? Like, you're just like, wow, is that in the Bible? The boring, or the boring, the Bible is not boring. You just have to find the right parts in it. Um, but I, I find this hilarious. I'm not really preaching on it, but what I really find funny is not necessarily this text, but verse 25. It's the last verse in the chapter. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. End of chapter. Enough said. It's like another day in the neighborhood for Elisha, you know, just calling down bears and stuff. But I don't have time to unpack that text, but I just found some humor in it. And maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Um, we're in Romans chapter 12 today, so hopefully you're there as well. And as you turn there, would you stand with me this morning and as we read the word of God? These are Paul's words to the Roman church of what real Christianity looks like. And, and I would ask that as we read this text, that you would allow the spirit of God to, to use the word of God to cut and to transform and, and to really um, illuminate, is this passage... Um, would this passage describe the way that you live your life? Allow the Spirit of God to speak to you as we read this. Romans 12, starting in verse 9. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. It says this, Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And underline this next part. Take delight in honoring each other. Or some versions say, prefer one another in love or outdo one another in honor. Verse 11, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. What is that confident hope? The hope of Jesus, the hope of heaven, right? Rejoice in that. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. And when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you and don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy 
and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil and do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Now, underline 18 if you're taking notes. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge and I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning that you would speak through me exactly what you want. That there would... um, be just an openness to receive your word, an openness to hear your voice, and uh, to be changed, Lord. So I just pray that um, we would have open minds and open hearts, and that your word that brings about transformation to our hearts and to our lives uh, would just speak in a powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. amen. You may find your seats. Two ideas that I want to talk to about uh, found in verse 10 and verse 18, and these ideas are preferring one another in love or outdoing or taking delight in honoring one another, and then in verse 18, doing all that we can, doing everything that you can to live at peace with everyone. Now, September 14th of this year, Elizabeth and I will have been married nine years. We're on our way to nine years, and it feels like just yesterday that I was standing right here holding her hands, looking at Jeff, and Jeff's talking, and his mouth is moving, and I'm not really listening because I'm thinking about other things. And, and uh, I, I, I'm so thankful that our wedding was recorded because in going back and listening to the sermon, I do remember this. I remember Jeff saying this, Austin, you don't stand up here today taking Elizabeth as your spouse. And Elizabeth, you don't stand up here today taking Austin as a spouse, you are giving yourself to each other. You are giving yourself as a spouse, and you need to prefer one another in love. And I remember that, and I remember thinking, I don't know what that means. Nine years ago, I didn't truly understand what it meant to prefer Elizabeth in love. Now, what does that look like? What does it mean to prefer her in love or take delight in honoring her? I think it really just comes down to this concept of the culture of joy. How many are familiar as we've talked about the culture of joy at New Hope? Okay, we got to do a better job, like four of you, okay? Um, Jesus first, J, others second, O, yourself third. And if we can get that in priority and we can get that in line, true joy begins to flow up through our hearts and in our lives as we place Jesus first, other second, and then yourself third. That really is the essence of delighting and honoring others above yourself. That truly is the essence of preferring one another in love. Now, preferring Elizabeth in love isn't necessarily easy for me. Why? Because I love me, (laughs) right? Like, I think most people find it easier to love themselves than it is to prefer someone else in love. Uh, I've got young kids, and when I come in from grilling burgers, and I've got that delicious Munster cheese just melted perfectly over my burger, my first thought is not, how can I serve my kids so that I can eat a cold burger and cold sides? Right? Like, that's, this is not my, my, my first thought. When I get home from a long day and it's been exhausting and I've been in meetings or I've been doing this or I've been doing that, it's not my first thought to say, how can I prefer and honor Elizabeth and my kids over myself? But I will tell you that in the last nine years, I've gotten better at it. Why is that? Well, one, the grace of God in my life refining me and helping me. But two, my love for Elizabeth has grown. It's grown deeper. It's grown wider. It's grown stronger. As I've loved and grown in my love for children, it becomes easier to prefer them in love, to take delight in honoring them. Church, can I encourage us to not just to pretend to love each other, but to really love each other. What would, I'll ask you this, what would it look like at New Hope 
if we really took this culture of joy and put it into action? What what if we really put Jesus first, others second, and then yourself third? What what would church be like? I I think most people uh, would say that it's greater to give than it is to receive. How many would say, like, I really love giving. I don't mind receiving. You know, like, if you want to buy me something fancy, you know, I can tell you what those things are. You know, I'll let you know. But, like, anybody else, like, I like giving, you know, more. Why is it so hard for us to give up our preferences? Why is it so difficult to prefer others first? Um, I, we all have preferences, and I've heard a number as I've been on staff here a little over 10 years, and I've heard a number of church preferences, and, and these are just things that I've heard for the last decade. Now, I'll share them with you, just a short list. I can't worship with the lights dim. I can't worship with the lights bright. Worship is too loud. Worship is too quiet. I love it when the pastor wears a full suit and tie. I love it when the pastor looks more relatable and more relaxed. We need more choir specials. We need less choir specials. Worship is too short. Worship is too long. Pastor Weaver is the only anointed preacher. We tolerate the young preachers. I've had people say that. I like hearing the younger preachers because they're more relatable to me. I've had people say that. I love it when Pastor Brett leads. I love it when Marin leads. I love the video announcements. The video announcements are impersonal. The coffee is too strong. The coffee tastes like water. It's too hot in the church. It's too cold in the church. I can't hear the drums. The drums are all I can hear. We all have preferences, (laughs) right? We've got preferences. I've got preferences. I've got ideas of how I think church should be done. A wise old lady, much older than I, once said this. Things can be different. They don't have to be right or wrong. Elizabeth Weaver, okay? (laughs) And I kid you not, she told my kids. I got some people looking. They're offended for Elizabeth in this moment. She's four and a half years older than me. She's my puma. She's not quite cougar status. She's puma. Um... (laughs) But literally, this week, my seven-year-old and four-year-old are arguing over what is the best fruit. Strawberries are the best. No blueberries are the best. And Elizabeth says, kids, it can be different. This doesn't have to be a, a point of right or wrong. And I said, ooh, I'm using that in my sermon this week. That's good, Elizabeth. Wow, look at that wisdom just pouring from you, right? The problem is that when we have preferences, we tend to spiritualize those preferences. We have these encounters where we encounter God in a particular room or in a particular environment or through a particular song or style of music. And so we associate those encounters with our environment instead of with our creator. I'm so thankful that throughout my life I've been able to encounter Jesus in numerous different locations. In my truck, in a tree stand, in my dorm room, in our uh, house, in my bedroom, in, in a podunk town of Lineville at a church on a Sunday night with 26 people where there was a guy that was 102 and I was 19. He was five times older than me and I'm encountering Jesus in a powerful way. I remember standing in the Mercedes Benz uh, Dome in Atlanta, Georgia with 66,000 college students worshiping God and encountering him in a powerful way. And, And All of these different places in the 6 p.m. service here in the Sunday night, the 8 a.m. service, the 9.30, the contemporary service, I've encountered God and I'm so thankful that God can move in might and power when we focus on him. How many of you have encountered that? Where it's like, yeah, I've encountered God in the woods. Yeah, I've encountered God in this different place. Yeah, I've encountered God when things don't line up, even when it's the least expected. Even when I walk in, I'm like, how is God going to move in this situation? How how am I going to get past this? And God just meets us there out of his mercy and out of his grace and out of his goodness. I'm so thankful that God is not just contained to one style, to one 
uh, environment, into one whatever. God can meet you wherever we're at, but I believe, and hear my heart, church, I believe that one of the greatest roadblocks for Christians encountering Jesus is when we focus more on our preferences being met than rather meeting with Jesus. When we, when we walk in and we're more concerned about what the set list is in worship rather than just saying, I'm here to worship Jesus because he saved my soul and I love him with all my heart. What would it look like, church, if we really got the culture of joy down and we came on Sunday mornings and we were just passionate about Jesus? We just said, it doesn't matter the st- song, the style, the volume. It doesn't matter about that. I'm just here for Jesus. What would happen if we just said, man, I don't care if I've got, you know, Pastor August or Pastor Zach and August has got this big beard and he just looks young and whatever, or I've got Pastor Weaver and he's older and whatever. I'm just here to hear the word of God because I love the word of God. And I know that there's transformative power in the word of God. What if we just really just prioritize putting Jesus at the center of it all? And I think, church, that you guys do a really good job at that. I looked out during worship during, during uh, Living Hope, and I saw people of all ages worshiping God together. That is special. That is something that is remarkable. That's something that we don't get, and it's uncommon in today's culture. I'm thankful that we have a multi-generational church, but hear me and hear my heart in this. Please hear me. Being multi-generational in church services means that there will be things that you don't personally enjoy. But that's okay, because church is not about you, it's about us. Church is not about me, it's about us. If a successful uh, weekend of worship and services and a a successful weekend of church is based upon um, how the sermon was and how it ministered to you and how worship was and how it ministered to you, you're missing the point of church and you're doing church wrong. Why? Because I can worship and you can worship in your car and encounter God through worship at any time in any place. And you can read the scriptures and have the spirit make those come alive and jump and come alive anytime in any place. But what you can't do by yourself is a symbol to edify, to, to draw together and come together so that we might encourage each other as the day draws near. See, there's something about coming together that's special, that, that is unifying. Let's become a church that takes joy, that delights in honoring each other. The point of church isn't about you. It's about Jesus first, and then it's about others. And when we can really focus and hone in on that, man, amazing things start to happen. I am so proud um, that despite generational preferences, we've been able to to maintain for 32 years a multi-generational church. You, you guys are, are, are mature in that, and I thank you, and I encourage us, as we move forward, let's continue to be that. The second portion I wanna look at, and I don't have long, is verse 18, where it says, to do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Sometimes living in peace requires letting things go. How many have ever had a roommate? Okay, how many have a roommate? Some of you guys are like, we got I think next week we need to work on marriages, okay? There's a lot of people who are like, I don't have a roommate, okay? Right? If you've ever had a roommate, you understand this when I say this. Sometimes living in peace means living in silence. Anybody relate? Like college dorm, spouse, right? Like there are things that I do. I know this is going to be a shocker for some of you. But there are things that I do that my wife just puts up with because she loves me. I know it's shocking. (laughs) But there are also things that she does that I just put up with because I really genuinely love Elizabeth. We fold laundry differently. I have a tendency to leave clothes by the side of my bed. If I'm gonna wear the jeans tomorrow, I put them away, right? What's wrong? 
We rinse our dishes, and I like to put them immediately into the dishwasher where she puts them in what I call the purgatory side of <laughs> the sink. Where it's just like, we'll deal with that later. You just sit there and you think about that, you know? We do things differently. Our basement is filled with taxidermy, and one of us loves it. <laughs> okay? There are things that we do that could bring slight frustration in our marriage, but in order to live at peace with one, with one another, we have decided to just let it slide. Some things are just not worth being talked about. Why? Because pants by the side of the bed is not an issue of sin. Because how you fold laundry is not a sin issue. Some people are like, oh, but it is. Like, it, it is. You don't know. At my house? At my house? It is. No, it's not. Right? At the end of the day, I stand in confidence knowing that Elizabeth loves me. And she stands in confidence knowing that I love her. And out of our genuine deep love for one another, we just let the peripheral things that don't really need to be addressed, we just let them slide. We just choose to not talk about it. We choose to not live in a place of unnecessary conflict. Am I saying that we never bring up things that need to be addressed? Absolutely not. If there's something that needs to be addressed, we bring it up. We talk about it, we deal with it. But there are some things that just aren't that big of a deal. And we make, as a married couple, a conscious effort to live at peace with one another. How many know that words have the power of life, right? Your words have the power of life. From the very beginning, we see that, where God speaks and the earth was formed. Now, your words carry life and the power of life. Maybe not to that extent. That'd be awesome. It'd be like, I speak tacos right now, you know? Like, that'd be great. But that's not what I'm talking about. But your words carry life in different circumstances and different situations. You know one of the quickest ways to get over an offense? Stop talking about it. Because every time you talk about it, you just are breathing life into that situation. And, and I've done this and I've been guilty of this where something happens and I'm trying to work through it and I feel like talking about it is gonna make it better. And so I go and I talk to seven or eight different people and now instead of just me having to work through it, now I've got seven or eight people that have to work through that offense or through that hurt or through that frustration. And unintentionally, I've created more speed bumps for more people to have to endure and work through. Words have power of life, I, I, I try to ask myself this, if it's not an issue of sin, if it's not a sin issue, I ask myself this question, by bringing up this topic, what am I wanting the result to be? What, what is the purpose in talking about it? Now please don't hear me, I'm so thankful that you guys are mature and a wonderful congregation. If there's something that needs to be addressed, we are all ears, and I hope that you would know that and you'd receive that. We're a relational church. That was the first thing that we talked about. We want to. And so if there's something that you're seeing, come and talk to us. We, we want to hear that. We want to know that. But there's also this truth that I'm talking about today, that words can spread life. And I don't want to be a person that's spreading life in the wrong things. Does that make sense? Guys, I'm so thankful that you guys do a great job at, at these two points that I've talked about. About taking delight in preferring one another in honor and doing all that you can to live at peace with each other. And I proudly say for 32 years, we have been a multi-generational church. That's amazing. That's uncommon. That's unique. That is one of the strengths of New Hope, and I'm so thankful for it. We have ministries for our tots all the way to our seasoned tots, okay? I love having a choir. I love singing hymns. I love singing new choruses and new songs. I love that growing up, I had like 12 sets of grandparents because my grandparents lived all across the country, and they died. And I had like 12 sets of grandparents, but I also am so thankful that growing up, it wasn't just grandparents that I was friends with, that I had kids my age that I was friends with. I'm, I'm so thankful, and I love that we have an orchestra. 
I'm thankful that I get to hear Pastor Zach and Pastor August, but I'm also thankful that I get to hear Pastor Weaver and Pastor Jeff. Sorry, Jeff, you've bumped into the old category, okay? I'm, I'm thankful that there are those who are older and you've been a part of this church for 10, 20, even 30 years and you have loved me and walked me through my immaturities. I thank you. I, I feel honored that people would give me a chance, that people would love me through those, those things as I'm developing and I'm growing into the person that God has, has had me. I'm thankful that when I look out, I see faces of all ages worshiping Together, I love this church. I love that it's multi-generational church. It's not always easy, but it is so worth it. It is so worth it. And I think the only way that we can really maintain to continue to be a multi-generational church is summed up in verse nine. And I love the way the New Living Translation puts it. It says, don't just pretend to love others really love them. Don't, don't just say that you love older people. Really love them. Don't just say that you love younger people. Really love them. And the only way, church, the only way that you can genuinely love other people is when you have your priorities set straight and you love Jesus first. And as you begin to pour out your love to Jesus, Jesus begins to place in you a love for different people, for people that you thought that you could never forgive, that you could never love. God will begin to place and change your heart so that you can look out and be like, man, I genuinely love them. And as you genuinely love them, then we can delight in honoring each other and living at peace with one another. In a minute, we're gonna close by singing the song, Jesus at the Center. It's one of my all-time favorite songs. It's such a beautiful prayer of just placing Jesus at the center of our lives, of this church. And, and I, that, that would be my prayer for you today as a church, that we would, we would really um, reprioritize and, and have Jesus as the center, Jesus first, others second. But before we sing, I just wanna close in a story. Is that okay? This is a true story that happened less than a week ago. This happened last Sunday night. And I'm standing up. I was playing uh, guitar on the worship team on, on Sunday night. And uh, we had some missionaries here. They were from China. I can't say their names because we're live streamed. But they work with Teen Challenge. And so these people are seeing these people that are atheists, that have grown up in a communist, oppressive situation and country. And and. They're addicted to alcohol and drugs. And these two missionaries that were here with us Sunday night are seeing people set free in the name of Jesus. And it's just super powerful time. And I loved being able to hear that short window. Now, these missionaries weren't uh, yes, necessarily like spring chickens. They, they had crossed the hill. You know, they were over the hill, if, if, uh, if I can just describe them to you. And uh, after Pastor Jeff preached, Right here in this, this seat, our missionary was sitting here. And we we're about 10 or so minutes into just the altar, the response of prayer and worshiping. And I watched this young 11-year-old boy come down here, sit right next to him. And he looked at him. And he puts his hand on the missionary's shoulder and lifts one hand to heaven. And he just starts to pray and his leg is moving back and forth because it doesn't touch the floor yet. And his face is just so concentrated. And you could just sense that there was like an anointing flowing through this young boy as he was praying for this missionary. And this missionary was just receiving it. And I almost took out my phone because I thought, what a beautiful picture. What a perfect demonstration of what a multi-generational church looks like. But I didn't want to be that person that takes a picture of like an intimate moment. You know what I'm saying? It's like getting out your camera during like the kiss at a wedding. It's just kind of like, eh, you know, like, and I didn't. And after service, he was out in the lobby and he was talking with Pastor Jeff and, and Gay Wilson. And with tears in his eyes, he starts talking, who was that boy that came up and prayed with me? And it was so powerful. It was so spot on. And he said, he began to prophesy over me and my ministry. And I'm so thankful for that. Church, can we fight to have a multi-generational church? 
It's so beautiful because guess what, older people? You need young people. And guess what, young people? We need the older people. We need each other. We can learn from each other. I am constantly learning from my kids. I'm constantly learning about myself from my kids. I'm constantly learning things. There's sometimes where Sam opens up his mouth. I seriously think he's going to be like a Ravi Zacharias someday. I, I'm dead serious. He asks all of the questions, and I hope that he can be. And I hope that he, he just walks in, in purity and, and just he can help people. But there's times where my son opens up his mouth, and I'm going, that is profound. That is from the Lord. Church. Please, put Jesus at the center. Let's, let's get rid of all the peripherals. Let's just make it about Jesus this morning. Would you stand with me all across this room? Jesus, I pray, God, that if there's any area in our life that is just preventing us from, from encountering you, God, I pray that we would lay it down, that we would recalibrate as a church, that moving forward we say, Jesus, it's all about you. It's always been about you, and it always will be about you. You are the center of everything. So, Lord, this morning, we turn our hearts, we turn our eyes, we turn our attention to you, and we proclaim this in song as we sing this as our prayer. Let's sing this together.